Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Florida City and County Management Association's webinar entitled Organizing the Legislative Process, Agendas, Meetings, and Minutes. My name is Bob Lee, and I have the honor of serving as your host today. Joining me as co-host is Dr. Dina Hurst and Mr. Mike Ryko. Both Dina and Mike are employed with the John Scott Daly Florida Institute of Government, and they will be the people who will be assisting our attendees most with technology needs, as well as our panelists today. Sponsors for today's program include the Florida League of Cities, the John Scott Daly Florida Institute of Government, and the Center for Florida Local Government Excellence. Corporate sponsors include Government Services Group, Strategic Government Resources, and Granigus. For those who have not participated in an FCCMA webinar before, we do use Zoom. Uh, all attendees are muted, but if you do have a question, we encourage you to submit it in the chat box. We always make sure we get the questions addressed to our panelists or presenters as they may be uh, for today's program. With those introductory comments, it's now my pleasure to introduce our two presenters. First, there's Jennifer Johnson, city clerk in the city of Tamarack, and Jack Al Butler, Director of Support Services for the City of Ocoee. Jennifer, Al, before you begin your presentations, would you mind just briefly summarizing your backgrounds for attendees? And I think, Al, you're going to start us off subsequently. Right. So, Jennifer, go ahead. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I see some very familiar names on the attendee list. Um, my name is Jennifer Johnson. I'm the city clerk in the city of Tamarack. We are down here in Broward County, so we are a very large county. We are very busy. I've been in local government for about 12 years now. I've worked in other local governments here in Broward County, and I'm happy to be here with you today. I've been with the city of Okoy for 16 years, the last 10 years as the director of support services. Uh, prior to that, I was in the private sector and also with local governments in Georgia and Tennessee, as well as the Florida Department of Transportation. Next. We're going to get started today by recognizing that legislative process is not only a public process, but it's also a scripted reality show. We are participating in theater. We are the producers and writers, uh, the directors, uh, but not the on screen talent, if you will, uh, for most of what we consider to be the legislative process. The agenda that we're going to talk about initially, how that's put together, that's sort of the storyboard or the script uh, that's utilized in order to drive the event. Many sections do have to physically be partially scripted when you're going through a first reading, second reading, that there are procedural things that have to be done. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about how you manage those parts. Of course, you have to manage the meeting itself. That mostly is done by the elected officials. but there's a lot of work that we need to do in preparation for the meetings uh, that we'll talk about. And plus, some of us have, you might say, uh, a bit of a regulatory or parliamentary uh, process that we go through during the meeting. And then afterwards, you have to write a script for the new show, which we call the minutes of the meeting. So let's talk about what we're going to cover today. Next slide. We're going to talk about how to produce the agenda, both the individual items and pulling it together to be the whole thing. Jennifer's going to cover most of that. Then I'm going to get into the business of conducting the meeting, including the public, and also some of the ins and outs of Robert's Rules of Order. And then Jennifer's going to conclude by talking about the minutes of the meeting and putting those out in, for the public to see. Throughout the conversation, we're going to be talking about the use of technology and how that is being increasingly utilized to make our lives easier and to increase transparency for the public. Jennifer? Next slide, please. So um, this is a look at the organizational landscape of the city of Tamarack. I know that a lot of cities that throughout Florida or all cities throughout Florida vary in size, vary in staff size, vary in capabilities but we are a city manager uh, commission form of government. Our mayor is Michelle Gomez, vice mayor is Mike Gallen, and then we have commissioners Marlon Bolton, Alvin Villalobos, Deborah Placco. Um, our city manager is Kathleen Gunn, 
and our city attorney is John Heron. Um, we just did the uh, census and we, uh, in Tamarack, we're right around 71,000. So as I talk through some of the uh, issues today, maybe it'll give you a little um, idea of what we deal with here and maybe the pace of things and how they might differ from what you are doing in a smaller city or what you're doing in a larger city. Next slide, please. So today, primarily, we're gonna talk about agenda management. As a city clerk, this is the crux of our job. Um, it's like a machine that goes by every two to three weeks. And so we kind of lean on a lot of process management in that to make sure it's a functional, good legislative process that the commission can be uh, ready to roll out with on the night of their meeting with no issues. So we wanna look for a consistent agenda structure we want to have a long-term view of scheduling meeting content. That's something that we do very well here in Tamarack. Standard agenda item format is extremely important. We want everything to look alike so we're all on the same page. And if someone was to look at it today or look at it in three years, it would all kind of look the same and they would know what they needed to find. We want to establish a workflow for internal review. We want to create submission deadlines by item type. We want to sort, classify, and arrange the agenda items appropriately on the agenda. And then we want to publish the agenda both internally and to the public. Next slide, please. So agenda content really varies by jurisdiction. Us being a medium to large size city, our agendas have uh, many components to it, including a consent agenda, a regular agenda, public hearings, and then of course we have our quasi-judicial. And then at the end of our agenda, probably like some other cities, we have that kind of catch all other section where we put things we really don't know what we know, what to do with. We have a section for public comments and we have sections for reports. Um, as we're aware, we have the public comment section or the public participation, which is required by the Sunshine Law. And by uh, so we, re we put that up at the beginning of the, of the agenda for everyone. And it requires that public comments on agenda related items we have public comments for unrelated agenda content. We always love those when people come in. And then we have formal public hearings for the legislative process. And those are usually quasi-judicial or public hearings. Next slide, please. So it's important to understand when we are setting rules for how we're gonna put out the agenda, who sets the agenda? Is it the commission? Is it the clerk? Is it the city manager? And this can be kind of a slippery slope. Um, so is it established by your charter? Is it the mayor of the county commission? Is it the city council president? Or is it the city and county manager? In the city of Tamarack, the ultimate decision-making for what gets on the agenda relies on the, on the city manager. However, everything is supposed to come to the city clerk and then I'm supposed to put it together and then she gets final approval. So it can be a little bit different for everyone, but having a good system and a good practice for how it gets published to the um, public is important and knowing what that structure is. Agenda, how are agenda items proposals reviewed? Sorry about that. Reviewed, classified or scheduled prior to publication and city and county clerk has a responsibility for agenda distribution and publication. We do this in, in Tamarack. Um, we usually publish on Thursday afternoons where we have our meetings on uh, Wednesday evenings and um, so I publish the agenda on Thursday afternoon, usually around five o'clock, and I immediately send um, an email to all my commission members and all the department heads, and I give them a link to the agenda. And here we still print out the agenda for the uh, members of the commission. So I also let them know that I'm delivering the book fairly quickly and hopefully to get that to them soon. Next slide, please. So our basic agenda structure probably looks a lot like uh, many other cities. It's your call to order. It's your roll call. We still do the Pledge of Allegiance here in Tamarack. We have the city attorney report, the city manager report, public participation. We quickly knock, quickly knock out the consent agenda, the regular agenda, first reading of ordinances, then we go to public hearing items, second reading of ordinances, quasi-judicial and other. The, in Tamarack, the commission has the opportunity to rearrange the agenda if they feel so inclined to do so, um, but we try and put it in the same order every single time, that way we know what's coming. Our quasi-judicial items are at the end and we have a night meeting that makes it difficult. So that's probably the thing that moves the most. And if we have guests here that are here for presentations, we'll move them up if we possibly can. Next slide, please. Al? Yes, well, we're very similar to, to what she was showing there for Tamarack. 
Uh, we usually put all our presentations and proclamations up front uh, because we they usually represent uh, the biggest crowd. And we want to be able to get those people uh, so that they can go home if they don't want to stay for the whole meeting. And uh, we also are able to uh, to make some minor changes in the agenda through that process. We don't really have much in terms of staff reports. That's mostly the city manager talking about anything that's being changed in the agenda because under our charter, the city manager establishes the agenda and they're able to review things and, and make changes at that point. We often have some emergency agenda items such as uh, purchasing uh, capital items like replacement pumps for sewer treatment plants and things of that type. Uh, and we try to have citizen comments about items that are gonna be on the agenda at this point, but items that do not have a public hearing. Next slide. So when we get into the uh, consent agenda, these are mostly things that have been, you might say pre-sorted by the city manager and the city clerk as to things that are non-controversial and they'll be covered by that. If however, one of the commissioners wants to cover that in a discussion, they'll ask at this point to pull it out uh, and it'll go through a separate uh, regular discussion. So that there'll be a motion you might say made to approve everything else. Uh, we move on through the regular process. We don't have a particular section called quasi-judicial. Uh, we handle those mostly through the public hearing uh, section of the meeting. And then at the end, we have an opportunity for each of the commissioners to speak for up to 10 minutes about something that's of interest to them. Next. So the consent agenda, I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, a little bit more in that I looked at the agendas for a lot of different local governments. And I saw that there are several, especially smaller governments, don't even have a consent agenda part. Uh, as I talked about earlier, we can pull things and move things off and on. So I really would recommend everybody look at having a consent agenda if they don't currently have one. Next slide. Now this, this slide will show you that we have a fairly strong consent agenda approach. If you look at item two, that's the election of the mayor pro tem. We go through a, a process here that pretty much lets the different commissioners by district take turns. And so this was considered non-controversial and was put on the consent agenda. If a commissioner wants to talk about it, they can pull it off and have a discussion. Uh, you can see then we also have the third item here large scale final subdivision plan. This is a quasi judicial type of approval where we are going through and uh, approving the final design for a subdivision plan. Uh, so we often have meetings where there are no regular agenda items at all. There's no topics of discussion. You have consent and then you have public hearings and first and second readings. Next. So one of the things that we do really well here in Tamarack is we know what items are coming forward every year at the same time every year. In May, we get our local option gas taxes. And at the end of April, we do our appointments to the Broward League of Cities Directors Board. In September, we do our budget hearings. And so what I do is, um, and you'll see it later in one of the slides, is that I, I have a old fashioned spreadsheet, it's available on our intranet and I set up all the meetings for the year and all the items that I know that are gonna come up regularly are pre-scheduled so we know that they're coming. Um, so we, and we establish those deadlines uh, for people. We usually have a deadline of, of Wednesday, two weeks prior to the agenda being, or the meeting that we have everything is due to the city manager for review. Um, we conform to all of those, um, all of those items. We, you know, we have to do, Certain, there are certain deadlines for how we have budget items. We have lots of advertising uh, requirements. There's always a few days beforehand that you have to have those and they have to be certain sizes. They have to be large or they have to be adjacent to one another for budget. So we try and work all of those things around that same calendar. Um, we've established a standard agenda development workflow. Things are come out of the departments. Then there are two, then they go to either purchasing, if they're on the purchasing agenda, they go to finance, they go to risk, they go to the assistant city manager, up to the city attorney, and finally to the city manager for approval before they get onto the agenda. We have an, we use an automated agenda system, just like many other cities. You can, we probably all use something that's very similar to one another. We just have different companies. So it creates item templates 
It makes it very easy for the users when they're getting ready to enter their items. And then we, they kind of reuse those things over and over because they're, they're items that are keep coming back. You know, there's not a lot of change. Um, so, and we know what we're gonna see. So, and obviously we set the agenda item submission schedule. Next slide, please. So some of the keys to a smooth operation is we are in constant contact at, from the city clerk's office in between the manager and the department directors to understand that workflow. And we're monitoring that throughout the process. So when I'm getting ready to publish on Thursday, I'm not running people down at four o'clock. That happens to clerks, it happens to me on occasion, but we try and set up milestones uh, with meetings with the directors and also meetings with the expanded management to make sure that we're not at the last minute pressing the go button. So like we said, we understand what the workflow is. Um, we review those processes, those milestones and those deadlines together and we walk through them. Um, we accommodate for emergency items. It doesn't happen here a lot, um, but we do get emergency items. And then we make sure that they're concise, well-written agenda summaries. So if someone was to look at them, they'd be able to make a decision pretty quickly in the first or two paragraphs that they're reading, whether or not they want to approve it. Next slide, please. Consent agenda items, all of our items um, here in Tamarack, I'm not sure if it's the same way in Ocoee, but all of our items are due at the same time. We don't have items that are due prior to one another. Um, we have them all due at the same time and they all go through that process. So we have our consent agenda items. We don't really do proclamations um, sponsored by the commission very much anymore. We do uh, proclamations sponsored by staff. Um, that was a decision that was directed by um, the, city, uh, the city commission actually, because it was taking up a lot of time and we were here until like 12 or one o'clock in the morning. Our, everything gets approved by the city attorney as well. Everything gets reviewed by them. Same thing with the ordinances um, and first, second hearing. Obviously on first reading, we um, a lot of times we don't have to advertise. There are some, some exceptions to that rule, but we always have to advertise for the second reading. So we make sure to plan accordingly for that and then make sure that when we advertise and for some reason that may get pulled then it still remains on the agenda, but it gets pulled officially during the meeting. So, and then we have other items that are requiring public notice. The ones that I think of that are other requiring public notice is they have some sort of you know, grant that they have to have and they have to publish that out and make sure that people have access to that. Um, but you know, there's not a lot of other things that need um, uh, actual advertising. Next slide, please. Um, I did notice that there was a question that came in from Jason, if I'm correct. And it's asked if I had a book on how to enter items. And um, so the city of Tamarack just moved over to peak agenda, which is Granicus. We use Novus here since 2008 and at uh, Granicus had bought Novus out. So we had just, our first published agenda was March 23rd. And I did create books and how to guides for each one of the steps on how to create an agenda item, how to create a meeting, how to publish an agenda, and how to approve or reject items. And all of that's available on our intranet site. So if someone was to come in tomorrow, they'd be able to pick up an instruction and be able to run with it and figure it out. Um, I hope that answered your question. Um, here's my, here's just a snippet of my general analog uh, forecasting for the city of Tamarack. You can see we have an agenda meeting on May 11th. We have each one of the directors assigned to uh, what the item is and whether or not it's a first or second reading. And we go through this and I, I live and die by this sheet. And I work with the manager on a daily basis, say, here's what's coming forward. Here's what's not, here's what's fallen off. I emailed the directors a couple days prior to it. I said, listen, you know, the deadline is on Wednesday to submit your items. I have the feeling some of these are gonna get pushed to the next agenda. And, you'll, and I'll see them very quickly going in there and making their changes. And this list will go to maybe a list of five instead of 15 overnight before the next agenda review meeting. But this is spread out for the whole year. So if we have items that we know are coming, we just move those around and shift and the city manager can see everything that's in the forecast coming at her. Next slide, please. Agenda item content. So this is housekeeping content. You know, you always have the meeting date, you have the item number and who the sponsoring department is. We have the summary of what the issue is and um, it describes what will be discussed. We give them background information. We have a question posed on why and what the action is that we're needing. Sometimes we have a staff recommendation, sometimes we don't. I understand the politics of that sometimes. So, um, and how staff doesn't always wanna be in there, but 
typically it's, uh, you know, the staff would like you to approve this. It's usually some sort of purchase or it's something else that's pretty uh, inconsequential or innocuous. So, or it's something that has to be done. Like at this coming agenda on May 11th, we're buying tires for the city. So that's something that needs to be approved. And it doesn't seem like a big deal, but you know, it could be a big deal to somebody. So, but that's ultimately what we need. And then of course that's, it goes down to the financial impact. We um, also have other things on our agenda slide or our agenda template. We've gone so far as to put our strategic planning item that it fall, that an item may fall underneath, or if it actually is attached to a specific, we're spending money in a specific district and there's an impact in that district. So we know we can kind of see maybe who the um, ownership of that, of that district or the commissioner that may want to speak about that item and they, they have a close relationship to that item and a need. So we have that on our agenda item template as well. Next slide, please. So procedural reviews, we start with the director that is initiating the item. And then we go through, and this changes for, we understand that this changes for every city, but we have a pretty big city. So if it's purchasing, it'll go through purchasing. A lot of times it'll go through the finance director. It may go through risk. It always goes through the assistant city manager. It always goes through the city attorney. And at the final approval is the city manager. So information to guide your classification. I know that Al had com commented on the consent agenda. Here in, in Tamarack, we often determine what's gonna be on the consent agenda based on value of money that we're spending. Uh, when I worked in the city of Parkland, our threshold was kind of right around $100,000 that we felt comfortable putting something on consent. Anything over that, it would probably need some discussion. Here it's a little bit higher because we have things that come up every single year and there we're bigger cities. So we spend more money. So it would go on consent here, but it might not go on consent in another city. So, uh, so you want to know who the contract is, whether or not it needs a second reading and whether or not a public hearing is required. Next slide, please. Yeah. One of the things that, that we came across recently is uh, some legislative impacts uh, on what we've discussed so far. First is regarding legal notices that uh, legislation was uh, passed that will change where public notices have to be put, uh, that it reduces the need for putting these in pub published newspapers, printed newspapers, and allows uh, many of these to be just placed on the local government's website. Uh, another thing that's coming along that may impact some of the financial reviews uh, is the local business damages. Uh, this particular legislation makes the local government responsible for business damages of when the impact of legislation is going to affect more than 15% of the revenue of a local established business. Now, related to this was a bill that did not pass, and that dealt with economic impact statements. That's where all legislation that you go through, with some exceptions, would have to go through an economic impact process and a statement would have to be provided. And if a local entity protested the ordinance after it was adopted, the ordinance would have to be suspended until such time as the court was able to rule on it. Now, this did not happen this year and we'll certainly be watching it for next year, but this could have a potential impact on pushing back the timeline on many agenda items. Next. Now, this is the first half of the standard template that we use in OCOI. Uh, this is a Word document, fairly low tech. We are moving to Civic Clerk, uh, which is a more automated process uh, to do this. But in the meantime, we've utilized these Word documents. And on the subject there, that's where we would put in the district where uh, something may be happening that's, that's particular to a, a geographic area of the city. Uh, but otherwise, these are fairly straightforward things. Next slide. And down on the bottom here, we're able to indicate the attachments. Financial impact would be things like we have the budget, and here's where it comes from, or here's how much it's going to cost. This is the thing that would potentially be expanded by the legislation to look at financial impact to external entities. Financial impact here meaning what it is, the impact is to the city. And then the type of items, those are guidance documents, and then you have sign-offs below that. Next. One of the other things that we have here in Tamarack, and I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure if you deal with this in, in other cities, but 
our commission is very active in putting stuff on the agenda. And um, for a while we were, I was, you know, the wrangler of all those, uh, all those items because the charter says that they have to come to me, but technically they would go to the city manager and then the city manager would send me an abbreviated email that says, put this on the next agenda. And I get like three words. And so we um, streamlined that process. We created a document that's available on our intranet and we've sent it to all of our commissioners. It's a simple, seamless doc um, in which they can determine um, it's a drop down menu so they can pick who they are, what date they'd like to have it on the meeting. They give us an agenda title, they give us the background information, and then they give us um, all the other information that we need. In Tamarack, also set out in our code, we have a comprehensive rules of procedure and commissioners here are allowed to have four items per person um, added to the agenda, but they have to be submitted to the city clerk's office uh, six days prior to the meeting. So that's on Tuesday, I publish on Thursday. So some, they're, the, they're my outliers in which I'm still keeping that agenda open and unsure of really what's going on until noon on Tuesday. But the form has helped so much with streamlining me receiving that and how I deal with it and getting it actually published into the city manager. She, so we have a distribution system. So when a, when a commissioner puts the item in, it will actually be delivered to the manager, delivered to the assistant city manager and myself, and I believe the assistant to the city manager. So we all kind of know what's going on and coming towards us uh, at any given time. Next slide, please. This is what um, our agenda templates look like. Um, this is actually on two pages. This is part of the peak system. We designed it based on very similar to what Al has in the, in the Word document. We had a very similar Word document. Now it's just completely automated in a system. It's all based on drop-down menus. As you can see, it's coming up. This is an item that went to the city commission on March 9th. Maxine Calloway is the director of community development. We wanted it on the regular agenda. We have a title. That's where we put the long title of the resolution, you know, the recommendation, background issue. It's, we were meeting strategic goal and that Tamarack is home. It's our number one goal. And then you can see all of the attachments that are attached to it. So after this in the agenda packet, as you're well aware, all the attachments would be on the backup to that. Next slide, please. So compiling the agenda. Sometimes this can be rough. Um, we like to have all of our backup um, ready to go, um, but sometimes I'm chasing it down. And I understand sometimes it happens, people get busy. Um, so we try to review every single item that comes through. It doesn't always happen. Um, so my job at, at four o'clock on a Thursday is to make sure all my temporary resolution numbers are matching of this, of what I have on my spreadsheet. My titles are looking good. They're all matching, they all look alike. The spelling, the grammar, all that stuff that I can see publicly is looking good and looking streamlined with everybody else. Um, if I discover any errors, our automated system is really good. We can put comments in, we can send it back to the drafter and we could get them to fix those things or where we see holes. Um, so, and then I initially put things where I think they should be on the agenda. Then we have an agenda review with the city manager and she says, no, maybe we need to have that on regular. Maybe we need to have it here. Uh, ordinances, public hearing, all that other stuff, they fall where they may. Sometimes there's a little discovery there in consent. Most of the directors like to put stuff under consent more than anything, because it's easy, but um, not everybody's always that lucky. So, and then of course we collect a list of proclamations and presentations. We do have those in Tamarack. However, right now they fall under the city manager's report. Next slide, please. So this is usually done uh, collectively. Um, for assembling the, uh, uh, the agenda. Everything is put in by the directors and then it works its way through the system, but I'm ultimately the one in the background that's managing the process and making sure it's getting to the next step on time. If I have to send someone an email to make sure that they're on top of it, make sure they're reading it and, and, and getting it to the next person, I'll do that. Because if we're still on a timeline, we, you know, it's unfair to the clerk's office when things aren't getting approved and we're here on Thursday night printing the agenda at 7, 7.30 and everybody else has gone home. So um, maybe advisable to put items that will motivate a big public response earlier in the agenda. We have this all the time in Tamarack. Um, we'll put them where they need to be and then we leave it up to the commission to really put it where they want it once we get to the meeting. If they wanna put them up at the beginning, their decision. 
Um, but if it's something under public hearing or something in the quasi judicial, like I said earlier, and it's at the bottom, they'll move it right to the top to disperse of that public public appearance. And sometimes, you know, like anything, you know, our the public is more educated than they ever have been and more in tune with what's going on in the city. We're getting bigger and bigger crowds at meetings and people participating. So sometimes our chambers will be packed. So finalize the summary language to be provided in the agenda outline to inform the public about what will be covered. So next slide, please. So this is this is you, Al, this isn't mine. Yeah, this, this is an example that, that we picked out where we trying to provide enough information for the public to be able to understand what the topic is going to be, uh, but not so much information that we've reproduced the entire agenda item here. Uh, so sometimes this is cut and pasted from the agenda item itself, but usually it's, it's custom created. Uh, here, we generally have to send it as part of the email that we uh, submit the Word document that's got the agenda item, uh, but uh, we can also work this out uh, separately with the city clerk or the city clerk will create it themselves from what they see in the agenda report. Next. So Thursday afternoon, Friday afternoon, now we're getting to the point where we need to distribute and publication and, and uh, public, uh, Never mind. Anyways, um, so it's Thursday. We know that some cities still are um, printing the agendas. Our goal in Tamarack is to go completely paperless. I don't know if we're ever going to get there in my lifetime, but we're going to try. So what we're what we're trying to do is um, really look at the documents that are absolutely necessary for the commission that they need that we're willing to print out. When you're starting to print out a thousand page book at the cost of paper today and the staff time, that gets expensive. So often what I, what I do is I um, publicize the agenda, I put it out, and then if I've kept anything back, I make sure to let the commission know that these were the items that I pulled back and said, this particular attachment was 100 pages. It happens to be a piggyback item. And, you know, it's from the city of Tampa, you know? So I'll say, listen, but if you need it, it's published as part of the public document. So if you need it, you can go get it. But that's a lot of paper. So we're trying to start really um, deciding on what we're going to print and what's completely necessary that they need. Um, we publicize it, we make it available to the public. There's nothing in our agenda that's not open to the public. Um, one of the rules that they passed here, it was actually a charter amendment by Broward County that all backup material needs to be published a minimum of 48 hours prior to the meeting. And if you don't have that and you go to amend the agenda afterwards, you have to make those all of that backup material available at the meeting for the public. So you have to print it for the public. So that's that re requirement, but even prior to that, we still have to publish according to the Sunshine Law. So that's the deadline here in, in Broward County is 48 hours, but that backup really starts to, to accumulate very quickly, but we make it all available. Our agenda system, like many of your agenda systems, just publishes the entire thing as a packet. And then we also have the option to publish just the agenda, and then we uh, publish the entire packet. So a, a person can see the nuts and bolts, or they can see the deep down uh, and dirty that they need. So next slide, please. Just like I said, we have the outline of the agenda with the listed items and the summaries on the cover page of the agenda. We have a methodology for which we put everything together and the document size, and then the attachments and how we can reach the total number of pages. Um, we do pu uh, publish as a single PDF, but our PDF is bookmark. So if they wanted to go to a certain section, they can certainly find it that way. And it makes it a little bit easier for them. Um, we don't use embedded links unless they're in the agenda summary, not actually on the cover page of the agenda, but other municipalities certainly do that. And they make it very easy for their constituents to see what's on the agenda. Next slide, please. So requirements for our, um, for our agenda packet is every department has a memo which is pretty much just copy and pasted into the electronic agenda assembly uh, or a, a template. I would like to get rid of the memo and just use the online format, but there we're not ready to do that yet. So eventually I think we'll get there. We have the draft resolution in the ordinance. We have the agreement. It's signed by the vendor prior to going on as backup. And in top of that here in Tamarack, the department director also has to initial 
next to the signature that they've read and approved of that agreement. Um, so, and that is prior to the city manager will not sign it without those initials. Um, then we have all of the necessary backup material. And then we have, we also publish our presentations prior to the meeting, which is hard on our directors, but we're moving forward. We're just ripping off the bandaid and asking them to go ahead and do that. It makes it easier when it comes to the meeting and the commission is a lot more prepared. So they know exactly what they're getting. Um, like we had kind of talked about a little bit um, earlier, it's paper versus electronic. I'm 100% for electronic. So if we can get to that point and eliminate all the paper, I would love to do it. I just, it's gonna be a slow process and we're just nicking away at it. So next slide, please. Yeah, here in Okoye, we utilize Laserfish. Uh, we have the, the web server version of that so that we put those out. We have links on our agenda pages that go straight to these documents. And you can see that we cut it up into each of the agenda items so that you can look at just the ones that you want. That's a little different way to organize it, but the, we're primarily trying to preclude somebody having to deal with a thousand page uh, PDF uh, to try to figure out then what's interesting to them. So this is, a, they can go through this fairly quickly. Next slide. So, uh, there's a lot, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead, Al. Okay. The, uh, there's a lot of products out on the market today and one of our sponsors has one, Granicus. Uh, and these range from tools to help you just sort of support the process to complete business management tools where they even do the, the voting during the minutes, they generate the, the minutes uh, after the meeting and they do many different things of that type. So there, there's a lot of technology out there. Uh, so that when you're looking at uh, trying to automate your processes, uh, be sure to consider the business rules that are implicit in these programs. Next slide. You want me to do that? Okay. So. Um, Complete or partial solutions. I think it's imperative that cities begin to move to an electronic process because like I said earlier, our communities are just, they want, especially after COVID, they want stuff available electronically and they want it available now. So um, I don't know what your city or county requires and whether or not they require it being posted to the web for Howard is easy, but um, so um, it helps with your staff and creating items and think, keeps things consistent. It helps with compiling the agenda, um, constructing and publishing the agenda, and it helps with recording um, the actions that are taken and producing the minutes by using some sort of uh, electronic system. Um, I think a COE may use BIS, but here we use we use the DCR system um, to do the integrated recording. We also use a product called Swagit to do streaming, so um, so everyone can see it out in um, if they're if they're staying at home. Next slide, please. So the pros and cons, like I said, the pros and cons of, of a web-based system, you know, the pros are it, it improves your internal processes and approval and your deadlines. It's, you could set deadlines for permitting items. I have a couple of people who don't always get things in on time. And so I'm always chasing them down. I only have a couple, thankfully, but um, it's just the nature of their business. So um, I can set those deadlines and shut off the agenda. Um, it sets the format. It's great for city branding. It helps with records retention and it helps with ADA accessibility. Um, the cons obviously are is it costs money and it's part of the problem that we had back in February, March of like instituting a new program was it was a lot of organizational change and some people really weren't biting onto it right away. Now, everybody seems to be into it, seems to be going fine. So that's worked out well for us. Next slide, please. The second topic we're gonna to talk about is meeting management now clearly we are not the people that are conducting the meeting uh, a lot of what we're doing is uh, in preparation before and dealing with after but there's some work that we can do to help manage the meeting itself some longer term actions we're going to talk about in a minute but let's let's look at the short term stuff we can't emphasize this enough look at where you're going to have big citizen participation. Try to understand where that is. Consider the need for crowd management. Uh, we potentially have to have our meetings at a different facility. So we have broadcast and streaming capabilities at two locations, both our regular city commission chambers, which can hold about 100 people, and another facility that can hold 400 people. 
So think about that uh, and the need to potentially change the venue for the meeting if that's possible with sufficient notice to the public of when that's going to happen. Next slide. Now, longer term actions deal with establishing parliamentary procedures. Now, many people talk about using Robert's Rules of Order, newly revised as the latest version, and we're, we're gonna go over that. Although in the interest of time, this is mostly going to be printed materials for you to download and look at later on and use as you will. But it's important to have the parliamentary role established in advance of the meeting. This could be the clerk, it's often the city attorney. We also need to establish civility rules. These will govern who can say what and how. Uh, we have those actually taped to the top of the podium and is reprinted on every speaker request form that people have to fill out uh, when they want to speak at the meeting. We also have standard duration for times. We have the red, yellow, green lights uh, up front with a three minute timer for uh, the people in the public to make conversations. And we use those also for our elected officials on the dais. They have a 10 minute countdown uh, for when they want to discuss particular items. And of course, there is often a way to try to include the public in a remote setting. Next slide. Robert was an interesting gentleman. Uh, he uh, came up in a uh, unusual family. Uh, his, his father was a Baptist preacher uh, and an abolitionist. He was born in South Carolina. He was the first president of Morehouse College in Atlanta. But what got Henry uh, Robert interested in having rules of order was he had been stationed as the Army Corps of Engineer uh, representative in New Bedford, Massachusetts. And as the son of a Baptist minister, he was asked to manage a meeting of the elders of the church. And he didn't do such a good job. Uh, it actually resulted in a fist fight that broke that went out into the street. And so he decided he needed to know how to run meetings. And so since there was a lot of material on that, he started writing his own. And he based it on a lot of the rules of procedure that were utilized at the time in the Congress. He died in 1923 after making three more revisions to his, and his great grandson is now on the committee that manages that. Next slide. So the main thing that you have to be aware of is about motions. And that the purpose of a second is only to show that more than one person is interested in the topic. Uh, there are instances when you can begin discussion without a second. For example, if something is on an agenda and somebody just wants to, to propose something that's already on the agenda, the presiding officer can uh, move forward with discussion at that point. By right, the person who makes the motion is supposed to be the first person to initiate discussion. Uh, and that the, the debate usually continues until there's a vote, a vote uh, chosen. Next slide. Once a motion has been made and discussion begins, only amendments can clarify or modify what the motion is. They're considered in the order in which they're presented, and you can have up to two on the agenda floor at one time. Uh, you can also make motions to move the topic to a committee or to do other things, and those are handled like regular agenda uh, amendments. Next slide. Uh, there are other actions that you can take. Uh, a point of order may be called if uh, someone did not get a second for a motion. Uh, you may also act to limit debate and different votes have different numbers of uh, people in support in order to be successful. For example, motion to limit debate has a requirement of two thirds to succeed. At the end of the discussion, the presiding officer is supposed to restate the motion, call for the vote, say how the vote is going to be conducted. This is really the most critical point in that this is the motion that's official. This is the motion that needs to be reported in the minutes exactly the way that is worded. Next slide. 
So here we're talking about action minutes. Now, I know a lot of people produce minutes that are stories. They're, they've written out who said what and what the discussion was and the questions and the answers and all that type of things. Robert's Rules of Order says don't do that. They say just write down what was decided. And the basic content here is listed. Uh, you have to keep up with the people leave and, and depart or arrive late, those types of things. But otherwise, motion, the result of the motion. Next slide. So you just need to know who made the motion, what the actual motion was, the language of the motion, and then what the vote. Any motion that doesn't get a second is still recorded in the minutes, but it shows that it failed. We're going to talk more about this in a minute. Next slide. The minutes under Robert's Rules of Order do not care that somebody seconded it. They don't care what the discussion is. They're not supposed to include in there things you want staff to do to follow up afterwards or proposals for future agenda items to talk about something that's popular in camera. Uh, so it's it should only be the wording that you absolutely have to have to talk. Now, we do have things, of course, like in adopting uh, property tax rates and things of that type where there's specific wording that we have to include. We have to have a record that shows a particular process went through uh, and we need to include those. We also need to include any place where a member of the board has indicated they have a conflict of interest and generally to also indicate that they filed the required form uh, with the clerk in order to say what their conflict of interest was. Next slide. If you don't read the minutes out loud, like we don't in the consent agenda, then the item needs to say that you have dispensed with the reading of the minutes and that you're gonna approve them as distributed. Uh, if there is any discussion about the corrections and things, of course, you would need to include that in there. And then the current issue of Government in the Sunshine Manual has language about how to handle minutes. Next slide. Now, before you get in the minute, in, in the meeting, uh, there are a few things you need to make sure that you've done. Um, one is underlined here, and I want to focus on that, draft the script for the chair. We often have procedurally complicated things to go through, like first reading, second readings, those types of things, where uh, title needs to be read, you need to talk about when the public hearing is going to be held. Uh, be sure and script those for the person who's going to be presiding at the meeting. Uh, Jennifer, you want to say anything about that? Thank you, Al. So this is one of the things that we instituted during COVID when we were having virtual meetings because it was so difficult to understand like what you couldn't read body language anymore. And so we adopted it as part of our process. We call it the agenda flow we go through every single item that's going to be on the agenda and how we're going to dispose of it and the order in which we're gonna dispose. We um, list if we're gonna have a special speaker, if we have someone joining us virtually, if we have um, people that will be accepting a proclamation, we don't want there to be any surprises for our mayor when she's going through a meeting. Um, and we also distribute that to everyone on the dais. So there's no surprises for them either. And we try and stick to that as best we can. And it has really helped out a lot. It makes sure that we don't miss anything. Um, as you know, during quasi-judicial items, there's a lot of procedures in there that you have to follow in order to have a good hearing for an item. So we make sure that we hit all of those. Um, so it's helped us out. It helps the mayor out. It helps you know, the management so they know what's going on. So I highly recommend it. Thank you. Next slide. Staff participation. I'm going to say some things that may be controversial for some of you. It is, if you don't have an agenda item, do not come to the meeting. Uh, the point here is to emphasize that the, the city manager, the county administrator, whoever it is, they should be the point of contact for the elected officials. And if staff is there, they're going to try to call those people out. They're going to want to interact with them directly. Don't do that. Uh, so if you have an agenda item, as soon as your item is finished, leave. Uh, you don't want to have those extraneous conversations. And as uh, Jennifer was saying, you want to limit surprises. One of the ways to do that is whenever we have this all the time, 
somebody comes up there and says, hey, we need $500 for the Little League, or we need $1,000 for something else, or we want you to waive the fee for our, the venue that we want to use lice for our meeting this weekend. You should always require that these people talk to staff first, rather than just show up and be a surprise to the elected officials who now are kind of on the spot. They can't come across as not supporting this particular group. Uh, so the other way to deal with this is to give them funding and that they deal with it directly, that we move to that where each of the commissioners gets $5,000 and they can fund whatever they want to. Out of that money, they just have to report what they did with it at the next meeting. Next slide. <laughs> Public participation, everybody got all excited about uh, they could participate from their home. I've seen smaller jurisdictions where they have a Zoom meeting and you have all of these members of the public up on the screen and sometimes they do things they shouldn't. Uh, I've seen little kids dancing. Uh, I've seen uh, other types of disruption uh, going on during a meeting. So I would help you, I, I advise you to avoid Zoom meetings uh, as a method of process. Well, one of the things we've settled on is that if you need to remotely participate in a meeting that we will call you when it comes to that part uh, in the session. But I think a lot of this is really falling out of favor now that there are a lot of local governments are dropping remote participation. Um, next slide. Okay. Open mic. Uh, one of the things that has really come to light uh, recently here is commissioners don't always know when they're on the air. So we actually made a big lighted sign that says on the air and they will sit there and stare at that sign when the meeting is adjourned until it goes off and then they'll start talking. Uh, so you need to make sure that uh, there's no, you know, secret uh, conversations that are get messed up on that. A couple other things though, to, to think about a camera setup. If we're going to streaming or we have our own TV station that actually broadcasts the, the, sh the shows, uh, you have to think about how the cameras are set up. I've seen city commissions where they looked at the mayor and maybe one person on either side because they didn't have a wide enough view uh, or they're so far away you can't tell what person is talking. Uh, sometimes you may have to actually have somebody from the city clerk's office managing the cameras or maybe you have multiple camera setups. But you also have to think about the people who are in the meeting, the commissioners, what can they see? So if you have presentations, do they have the ability to see those presentations? Do they have the ability to see people speaking from remote locations? Uh, next slide. Uh, we don't do real-time audio translations. Uh, while we're streaming, we uh, do that with the post meeting uh, using the YouTube capabilities. But prior to the meeting, things like PDF files and, and any pictures and things, we go through the process to check them with our ADA compliance to make sure that they can be read by uh, people who are visually impaired and that there's information coming across that describes what's happening uh, if people are not visually, visually able to perceive what that is. Next slide. Now we're going to talk about a couple of post meeting procedures. Um, and inevitably what happens at every meeting is th there are lots of things thrown out there and someone has to keep track of them. So this is something that's fallen on the city manager's office and the city clerk's office. Sometimes when I'm on the dais, I, I can't always keep up with everything. So I lean on a young lady that's up there. And um, what we do is we know that we have resolutions and ordinances and contracts that need to be signed. So we try and set deadlines for executing those documents. One uh, in this particular city clerk's office, we have a um, performance measure in which we wanna turn those documents around within three calendar days. Um, we, we have to execute them, record them, pass and adopted and get them scanned into laser space so they're available to the uh, public. We identify who is responsible for amending items if they're modified by the legislative body. That has been a problem in the past. So we need to make sure that department director is aware of the amendment that happened on the dais so they can change it if necessary. And then we distribute, record and retain the authorized documents. Um, there are lots of things, like I said, that come up as future items. What we do here is we have um, people that listen to the meeting in addition to the people who are there. 
And then we distribute a list the following day of any action and future items that the commission has issued to us. Like I want um, all of the copies of some of uh, this pertaining to this item or how many residents called in for this. And, and we try and keep a running sheet of all that stuff that we continually have to keep up with. Um, we prepare and publish the draft minutes and then we publish a recording of the meeting online. Um, in Tamarack, we have Swagit and they take care of that for us. And it usually uh, is posted within 24 hours of the meeting. And that's the video. And that obviously also has the audio. And then we have gone so far as to order a transcript and we usually get that within about 72 hours. It's ADA compliant, it's not beautiful. It comes through some sort of um, machine. So they doesn't always pick up all the words correctly but it's as close as we can get. And that has uh, really helped us in a, in a crunch to decipher sometimes what people are saying on the dais or even from the public. Um, next slide, please. Resolutions, ordinances and contracts that need signature. You know, we send them through the mayor or the chair and the and then we send them through the clerk and we send them through the attorney to make sure that they're done. We try and get signatures at least from the attorney because he's not here as much. So we try and get signatures from him first. And then we scan, record and archive and complete the completed documents. And we make those available online. Just like um, Al, we have uh, Laserfish. So we have that available to the public. And then um, we recommend adopting a policy to make the electronic uh, document the official original. So we keep all of the originals back in the vault but we have the electronic ones available as the copy of record. Next slide, please. Minutes. I know that minutes uh, can be kind of a contested issue among cities, especially among with the elected officials. Sometimes they have this idea that they sit up there on the dais and say, but I want this for the record. Okay. <laughs> I know it's kind of hard to manage that. We've gotten to the point where they, uh, and, right? in line with Robert's Rules of Order, there's no attribution in our minutes. We've limited the discussion down to just a summary of some of the topics that they talked about and their final vote. Um, it helps out the city clerk staff. We're able to turn those minutes around prior to the next meeting. That's another one of our per, uh, performance measures. And it gets to the, to the nuts and bolts of really what happened. The reason we were able to do that is because not only do we tape record up on the dais, the event by audio, we stream it, we have video. We, if you want the full details on why somebody voted that way or they want something on the record, they can go back and listen to that. But the bottom line is just the action that, that took place, who was there, what time it took place um, and where it took place. Um, those are the, the main crux of the items that you need on there. Um, initially, I distribute those to staff and then they get published with the agenda. And that's when the commission will read them in accordance with the Sunshine Law. If they wanna make any adjustments to those, they need to be done at a public meeting. So that's another great reason to keep them as short as possible. Um, we try and resolve any other issues. Sometimes there is um, you know, issues in the minutes. We try and resolve those prior to them being published. Um, and then we always refer back to the meeting recording or that transcript has saved our life in issues when they're talking over one another and you're not really sure where you're at sometimes in that meeting because everyone knows how difficult that can be sometimes when they're fighting. Um, but we still have to manage that. And, and like I said, that we've gone back to that transcript, we've gone back to that video and it is really, really narrowed down the crux of the issue. So we complete those drafts. When we publish them to the internet, we write draft on them. They are not signed. They are still uh, you know, subject to approval in case you know, the commission is unhappy with them. So, um, and then we'll make those adjustments. And if we have to, we'll bring them back again for actual adoption. Um, and then they're recorded in the laser fish forever and uh, kept in perpetuity. Next slide, please. So what to include in your action minutes, the type of meeting, whether or not it was a regular special or workshop, the name of the body that's meeting, date, time and place, um, the names of the persons in attending, I don't list senior staff, but a lot of other people do. Um, where I list them is if they have a speaking role for an item, they'll be listed in the minutes. Um, for instance, I'll have one that says, uh, Director of Financial Services, Christine Kajus provided a presentation, which is available in the city clerk's office. And then we're done. Um, whether or not the minutes were approved at the previous meeting or if they were corrected, and a paragraph on each agenda item and its disposition. My paragraphs are often a sentence or two. I try and summarize the key questions that they had about the item. And that way they can go back and say, well, why did they ask questions about the landscaping? Or why did they ask questions about this? 
at least we have some sort of inclination of what they were saying, but nobody in my minutes gets commissioner this asked for this. Um, it's a collective body that eventually got to a decision. Um, and then the time of adjournment. So next slide. Jennifer, uh, Al, just to, just to jump in here for a moment. Uh, we are at the top of the hour. Uh, typically we do adjourn right on at three o'clock, but Al, if you remember from the most recent professional development committee, there was some question about if you're moving along, uh, maybe we ought to allow a little more time to complete it. And I'm fine with doing that if you are. So that's, I'll, I'll, I'll make that your call. All right. We only have a few more minutes uh, left on here and I would like to continue just to have the completion. Good, let's do that then. All right, thanks. So uh, like we said, we use the agenda as a foundation for minute. That's kind of our template. And then we move on from there. Um, as you can see from these uh, example minutes, you'll see approved on consent, the motion carried five to zero. So nice and easy. Um, next slide, please. Uh, presentations are normally only listed in minutes by stating the name of the presenter and the subject matter, exactly how we just said that. I don't summarize what they said in their presentation. I say you can get a copy of it in the clerk's office and they can see exactly what it is. I don't, I don't always know what the pres, you know, what some of the directors are talking about. It's out of my league and I don't, uh, not, not a road I really want to walk down. So, um, so, but when then Presentation is needed to show the legislative history or foundation for the action taken. The body can order it to be entered into the minutes. So uh, next slide, please. When recording the votes in the minutes, when a voice vote is held, the minutes should reflect the ruling of the presiding officer. When a count of votes is ordered or the vote is by ballot, the minutes should record the number for and the number against a motion. When a vote is by roll call, then the vote for each member is recorded. This is probably the most typical process you see. Um, we do that a lot in the uh, regular, a lot of cities will do that for the regular or public hearing items, quasi-judicial items. And then for consent, they'll just do all in favor. Um, so next slide, please. Yeah, we have, a, we have a board that shows how each person votes up on the wall. And so each of our votes using that board is considered a roll call vote. And we're supposed to record then the vote of each of the persons uh, rather than just you know, the motion passed. Right. And here in Tamarack, we still, it was, I, I still call roll and I call every person's name on every single item. So it's make sure that it's in, uh, everybody gets to be heard and it's recorded in the minutes as such. So. Um, yeah, here we're talking about, uh, Roberts gets into some fairly detailed things about proceedings where you have long meetings. Uh, and it allows you to have some more discussions, but uh, mostly the direction to the private sector is once the meeting minutes are approved, destroy everything. <laughs> that they, they don't want you to have notes, they don't want you to have recordings, they don't have, they want you to have anything that could conflict with the official record of the meeting and what happened. Of course, we can't do that in the public sector, uh, but uh, it's important to recognize that the official action of what happened is recorded only in the minutes. Everything else is just supporting documentation. Next slide. So really you just have to find a balance what works for your commission and works for your clerk and works for your staff. So um, you, we all know how long minutes can take and they can be a taxing burden on a clerk's office to make sure that those are done. Some uh, cities have um, put that out and they have an actual company do the verbatim minutes for them. I, I, I think that's very expensive, um, but it can be done that way. So you just have to strike a balance on, on what would be good for your commission, what they're gonna be happy with, what they know about and what works for the administration. Yeah, this is an Okoye example where we essentially took the, the little part that was in the original agenda and then added to it a couple of action lines to show what happened and and it was all put together this is then tied to the section of the recording of the the audio recording that's on the biz data uh, device uh, to allow you to go straight to this and listen to the that part of the meeting next slide 
So minutes are generally included in the backup for the next agenda. Like I said, I put draft across them. There's no signatures and there's a disclaimer at the bottom that says if you're not getting the signed version, then they're not the final minutes. So they could have been amended at that time. We also say that um, video recordings are usually up within 24 hours for us. And audio recordings, uh, we keep them on file here. You can do a public records request, but they're really just an extra copy for us. Um, and then minutes are published on the website after approval by the governing body. My minutes are published back into Laserfish because they are stayed in, in perpetuity and everyone can get those. Um, and then I destroy the draft copy as soon as possible. Next slide, please. Yeah, we post ours on online. Uh, you can get to uh, our archive, which is on our YouTube channel, and we utilize the closed captioning on YouTube. Next. And then we have the minutes published and the supporting documents that are uh, grouped together. Pretty much uh, this is not the same as the agenda item. These are supporting documents that were presented during the meeting as opposed to prior to the meeting as uh, attachments to the agenda items. Next. This is um, what we do in the city of Tamarack. We have a page for our agendas and minutes um, in, in Broward County. Also, we need to publish every single board ad, advisory board agenda and all of their backup information as well. That's a requirement here. So we have agendas and minutes. We do the live broadcast on our website. We do the live broadcast on Facebook. And then this is where you can find the on-demand webcast. So um, everything is up there and there's years of video archive on there. Next slide, please. So just to summarize, we've talked about the agenda creation process using standards, uh, schedules that everybody knows about that you need to make sure that you have established the parliamentary process and the roles for the participants. You need to decide how you wanna do the minutes and you may wanna do multiple versions if you're looking at a possible transition from more of a storyboard type of minutes to uh, the abbreviated version. It, you need to make sure that all of your agenda items are ABA compliant, uh, that they're gonna be published on a website that has all of the, the things checked. There are a number of services that you can utilize uh, to make sure that your website is consistent with ABA requirements. And then look at utilizing automation for particular parts of the process or potentially putting the whole thing online if you're a larger unit of government that needs more formal management. And with that, we appreciate your attendance and conclude this presentation. Al, Jennifer, thank you so much for a very, very informative presentation. I think you've covered in just over an hour what would normally take two hours to cover that kind of detail. And what I liked about it was that very foundational information you provided. You didn't make assumptions that everyone knew everything about the process in terms of uh, how meetings are prepared and conducted and followed up upon. But at the same time, you did provide some, some unique and somewhat innovative ways to approach it. Um, and Jennifer, I liked how you set the stage about, you know, one size isn't fitting all basically, how jurisdictions are different. And I think Al, you did as well with, uh, again, the information that was provided, how it was provided, the pace, uh, everything I thought was exceptionally well done, and we want to thank you. Obviously, a lot of time put, was put into putting this joint PowerPoint together. And so on behalf of uh, uh, FCCMA, uh, thank you so much for the time that you put into it. And I do hope that some other city clerks, Jennifer, were listening in too, because as you know, this is a constantly learning uh, environment that we're in. And uh, city clerks have uh, uh, mostly have a major role in in agendas in one way or the other in terms of preparation or certainly subsequently so much as well. So thank you both again. And by the way, for the attendees, if you wouldn't mind just staying on just for another a few seconds uh, when we adjourn, because we will have an evaluation that's gonna pop up. Uh, FCCMA would like you to take a few moments and complete that uh, for their professional development committee. Thank you all again for your participation. Uh, Al, Jennifer, thank you all. And um, with that, I guess we're now adjourned. Thank you. Thanks.